Those, those, that era of party, you know, there wasn't no VIP. Nah. There was no VIP. Nope. VIP has fucked the party. It did. Because they put the VIP in the middle of the fucking day. No, look, but the spark was Kenny. I mean, come on, man. You know, you got a big part in that. No, I'm, I am, I am truly Kenny. part to blame for, for, the, <laughs> for the bottle culture and the importance of the sections. Um, but I partly regret it. All right, look, it's Brocky here, Whiskey and Cakes. We back in the building. Episode number whatever, but you know, I'm, I'm here with Kenny Burns, legend in the game, industry Appreciate vet. That. Appreciate that. Um, so many accolades. I could sit here for a long time, but we don't have much time, so we're going to get right to the meat. How you doing? Come on. I'm good, brother. Thank you for having me. What, what the you? fact that you have a podcast yeah. called Whiskey and Kicks. <laughs> it's fitting, right? It's appropriate for every situation. Indeed. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> what brings you to town, man? Uh, it's Howard University, man. H U. You, no. <laughs> uh, I sure. did not attend. I, I did attend the campus quite a lot. My wife graduated cum laude, but you know I have a very obviously super affin- affinity for Howard University and everything yeah. Washington D.C. So I'm home celebrating. So you've done a lot of things, man, like um, launching Revolt TV, yes. uh, Apple Ciroc, many other top brands, yes, in the game, and, and you call yourself the lifestyle specialist. Yes. So can you explain that to the people? Yeah. So um. I was in the music business for uh, a very long time. I signed Wale from here. I signed Akon. Mm-hmm. Signed a girl group Dream. I, I signed, you know, I worked with, you know, Jay Z and yeah. Dame on Reasonable Doubt. Uh, I just had a whole, you know, lengthy career in music. And around 2005, I kind of started playing in different spaces. And mm-hmm. those spaces were lifestyle marketing before it was called lifestyle marketing and then it was also fashion you know second black designer ever in Saks Fifth Avenue with Ryan Kenny Indeed. happened to be at Rockefeller um and Jay-Z wore the clothes and changed clothes video and you know Usher Ashton Kutcher everybody who's popping back then wore the clothes but my friend had the Axe account um Axe oh, Body Spray that's huge they were introducing themselves into North America and she basically was like, look, I need you to help me, you know, get this in some video. So mm-hmm. we went on, you know, on to create advisory boards for acts where industry vets would, we'd fly them to Miami, to California. This is back when there were no ambassadors. Like yeah, today okay. they're now called ambassadors and they get paid to move. But back then they were just happy for a trip. <laughs> Long story short, I was moving the culture around that kind of, you know, in that kind of big fashion, you right. know? And they were like, wait, how do you, how can you move people around? How can you? And it was because I was immersed in the culture and, you know, they were like, well, what do you call yourself? What is that? And I was like, I'm a lifestyle specialist. <laughs> and, no doubt. <laughs> and at the same time, too, around 2005, all the gray worldwides and the Uniworlds, they all were trying to seek out smaller boutique agencies to help them have more direct access. Okay. And in these agencies, there were specific people who had the relationships, like myself. Mm-hmm. Um, but I didn't start an agency. I just became the agency all upon, you know, all by myself. All, yeah, yeah. All, you know, everybody reach out to Kenny if you want to get something done. Basically. Listen, the dream is real. For sure, brother. You know that. So <clears throat> can you explain what is it? Is, so is that what it kind of means to curate a brand? Um. Well, to curate a brand, I think you have to understand the culture behind it. Okay. Um, you have to kind of be immersed in said culture and understand it like no other. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's why I've been able to curate brands like, you know, Revolt Television and the exception of, of the launch of Revolt Television. Yeah. Uh, Apple Ciroc was my launch. Delion Tequila. Yeah. Um, yeah. We were doing great things with um, Grey Goose before that, Belvedere, Moyne Hennessy before that. And before that, I created the Heineken Red Star Soul Tour, okay. which I hosted as well. So these were all things that I actually drink or actually participated in. And I think you're better received when it's authentic like that. Mm-hmm. And that is the you know, groundswell for curation. So, I mean, you've, you've come a long way. Do you have a mentor? Mm. I do have a mentor. Sorry, we're drinking whiskey and it's tea. It's all good. Um, I have a mentor. Um, I have a couple mentors. Um, Andre Harrell would be mm-hmm. probably the most prolific. He taught me about true culture, art. Um, he's the first man I saw with a driver. Okay. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? When I, uh-huh. when I met him, he had a whole side of an apartment building on West 90th or something Word. in New York. And, um, you know, first saw Basquiat and Warhol and just kind of started immersing myself into more cultural things outside of, you know, music and street culture. Mm-hmm. 
Um, but he's definitely one of one of my savants. Um, and so the importance, of, what, what would you say the importance of having a mentor? I've never had one. Yeah, the importance of having a mentor is to get free game earlier mm. than you have to you mm -hmm. know, experience it. Because sometimes the experiences are not pleasant, right? So right. you like to have the information right. going in, you know what I'm saying? Right, Indeed. And that's the purpose of a, of a, of a good mentor. So... Um, you know, DC, I have a, I have a bunch of questions, Rango. We're going yeah, to we need to get to the place, baby. We whiskey and kick, so we're going to get to the booze and we're going to get to the shoes. Um, so <clears throat> DC used to be known as Chocolate City and it still is. Yeah, but it's a, ginger fine like a motherfucker. Exactly. So what's your, what's your feelings about, because there is an upside and a downside to gentrification depending on how it happens, of course. Listen, and, if you can make the city better and not make the people that made the city go away, I mean, it's a win, right? But, yeah. but when does that really happen? It does. Because with construction, with new comes money. Right. And the, and the prices get higher and higher. So, um, you know, I just miss, I miss the vibe of uh, D.C., you know. And I believe that, you know, all cities are doing it, though. Yeah. I think sure. all major cities, the only true black city um, left is Atlanta. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, I'm talking mm -hmm. about Detroit. Mm, Dan Gilbert bought downtown, and he's definitely making it. Stock X, and I mean, there are a lot of companies that are moving to Detroit. But it um, could become that though. It's a lot of cheap uh, real estate there. Not anymore. Oh yeah. You said you get a building that size for a million dollars. Not anymore. Not anymore, huh? No. He bought the majority of downtown, like I said. It's crazy. But it's, you know what? It's 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 opportunity. I look at everything with a positive spin. I don't mm -hmm. really try to put the negative lens on on uh, opportunity, right. right? Because if they're building, that means you can build. If they're you know starting new businesses, that means you can start a new business. So there's opportunity. Yeah, it's, it's a tough thing. I mean, I wouldn't have said, you know, I'm here. <clears throat> I moved here in 94, and I can see the difference between back then and now. Oh, yeah. And, um, you You've know, grown, 94, yeah. Yeah, man, and I move over, and I go over to Ivy City, and I park my car, you know, and I walk to the, the distillery, and I'm stepping over homeless folks. Yeah, it's crazy. But I have a great time in the distillery. So it's a, it's a conflicting thing, man. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It bothers me. But and D.C. is only 10 miles by 10 miles. So it's right. kind of like, well, where are you going to go? Right. This is Obviously, true. Maryland and Virginia are getting all of the transplants. So, you know, it yeah. is what it is. So you um, you left D.C. and you went to, um, I know you went to school and everything, and you went to Atlanta, right? Yes, I moved to Atlanta uh, in 1992 originally to go to college. Mm -hmm. I had attended Freaknik, and it changed my whole perspective <laughs> on life Those and are the what days. my true purpose was. <laughs> um, and, yeah, ended up uh, becoming the biggest party promoter uh, yeah. in, in the AUC, which is Atlanta University Center in Spelman, Clark, Morehouse. Um, and Morris Brown, where I actually went to school. Uh -huh. um, so, yeah, it was a vibe. First to bring Jay-Z to Atlanta, you know, bought the Big Mac promo. You remember yeah, the Big man. Mac promo? Big, <laughs> yeah, Big and Craig Mac, for yeah, sure. Man. Had some really good times. That's, that's, that's heavy, Great man. times. So, look, man, I was telling my boy, I said, you know, I got Kenny Burns on the show, man. I said, um... And he uh, brought up Republic Gardens. Yes, sir. Remember those days? The legend Mark Bonds. <laughs> oh man. The, the Republic Garden. It was you know those those that era of party. You know there wasn't no VIP. Nah. There nah. was no VIP. Nope. VIP has fucked the party up. It did. Because they put the VIP in the middle of the fucking day. Look, look, but the spark was Kenny. I mean, come on, man. You know you got a big part in that. No, I'm I am I am truly me. part to blame for for the, <laughs> for the bottle culture and the importance of the sections. Um, but I partly. Regret it. Not regret it from the standpoint of creating business and opportunities for all these ambassadors. I mean, I created lifestyle programs. For sure. That all spirit companies use. But same time, you know, I, I miss the vibe. I yeah. miss I miss the dancing. I miss the singing. I miss the out of body experiences. I tried to bring that as a host. Yeah. And that's why I get paid the big bucks, but at the same time, they want to hear little baby. Yeah. They want to hear fucking Tech Nine or whatever the fuck his name is. Six Nine. What Six the nine. fuck <laughs> is going on? What the Waka Flocka? No, I love Waka Flocka, but yeah, what is yeah, going you know. on? <laughs> you feel me? No, like yeah. it's tough I, now, man. But see, but I don't care though. Hey, if you know me, you 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 know the legend. I'll yeah. play Elvis Crespo it, it, in the right, middle of right. nowhere. Then I'll just go back to some. You know, I'm talking about yeah, hey. M2 Made, original yeah, Juicy. For and sure, just, you can go a whole night without even playing no hip hop. Yeah, have a I could definitely. You know I could go a whole night playing R&B only. Mm -hmm. Like if I'm not a DJ, I definitely tell DJs that I work with uh, what to play. The only DJ I don't really tell, actually, D Nice and I are probably the greatest show on uh, earth. So he was there last night, wasn't he? Yeah, but he has no. He we went to dinner. He, okay, um, gotcha, gotcha. He didn't make it out to the club. He had a pre-event with 
revolt in somebody okay. earlier. But so it's it's beautiful when you don't have to tell somebody. But we always vibe off each other. So if I'm feeling something, he loves to get the perspective same. So yeah. it's just, you know, again, man, music and vibes are meant to be celebrated. And I just think now this culture is like, let me look good, stand in the corner and mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. and, and wear fake Balenciaga and like it's it's it gets ridiculous. <laughs> I really want to scream on people. Like I really want to sometimes just like go, but that's not who I am. <laughs> right. But it's like, bro, they don't make that. Like that's not. I have the right <laughs> version of that Gucci sweatshirt. Like that's it bothers it. me. It bothers <laughs> right. me. It really bothers right. me. Right. Either, either you got it, or you don't. No, man. because it bothers me. Because why do you have to? If if you can't afford it, doesn't mean you can't be hot. Yeah. I know these couple promoters like they really wear fake stuff. Right. You know what I'm talking about? And you got the girls, so why are you wearing the fake stuff? You are the promoter, you this, that, and the third. Why are you wearing the fake stuff? Like I mean, at I, the end of the day, it's an insecurity. Yeah, but it's also where society has gone that is another, like, it, it, it annoys me. Like, if you look at, like, what women are tolerating. Mm -hmm. I remember back in the day, like, you know, women were strong to the point where they told you, they're strong today, too. Right. So don't get it twisted. I'm not speaking on all women, I'm speaking on the youth culture, but they take so much from me. Like you, you really want to do with the tattoo all over his face. You right. Know, that's, that's where you're going in that's life. That's the future. Right. You're not demanding, <laughs> like you're not demand. People always talk about relationships too. You have to demand what you want from the door. Mm -hmm. You can't get in a relationship and then 10 years down the line when everybody's comfortable talking about, oh, well, I don't feel like, that well, hold on. Work. It's been 10 years we've been doing this. Yeah. Why? But I think that this culture it's kind of like that. You know what I'm saying? They don't mm -hmm. really, from the door, this is what I need. Mm -hmm. I've been married 19 years. Oh, word. I have some insight on this. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And, but yeah, but, and that's tearing the party up too. And I was, I was relating that back to the experience. It's like, we know why you're here. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Have a good time. Oh, but you're not here for that. You nope. want to, you want to get chose. You want to do this. this. So it's, you it's a whole show weird out. cup of gumbo. Damn, 19 years. No joke. Both my marriage don't add up to that. <laughs> yeah, listen. She's here too. She's in DC too. Oh, that's what's up, She graduated up, man. from high where she's off out here in the street somewhere. That's the way they do it. Yes, sir. So let's get to the booze, man. We got Uncle Nir sitting in front of us. Um, yes. I love this stuff. As you, as you can see, one of them is full. One of them is kind of yeah, one crack. You can even cracked. get here and yeah, <laughs> crack that joint. This is whiskey kicks. I don't play around with the booze. So that's right. um, how you know how did this come about? You know what, man? Uh, I've been in spirits for over 15 years. Mm -hmm. um, arguably some of the greatest brands out I've been a part of and contributed to the success. But I never had a piece. Yeah. I never had equity in anything. Um, and then randomly, a person I didn't even really know, uh, happened to meet him on a golf course. He was a friend of a friend. Was impressed because of the one day we met each other and the mm -hmm. stories that he heard about me and the spirits business. And he's like, look, I'm doing a raise. A $10 million raise for this brand and you'd be perfect for it. So of course, you know, everybody says Kenny, you're the best ambassador, this, that, and the third. I'm like, well, okay, okay, I can be an ambassador, but I have to be an owner as well. For sure, man. So um, I was like, there's no way I can do anything else in spirits unless I'm an owner. Right. So he was like, listen, we're doing a raise. We can introduce you. You know, this lady Fawn Weaver is quite the savant. She put this play together. They were telling me all the amazing things she had did. And then when I met her, she was my spirit animal. It was almost oh, like, dope. you know, you meet somebody and you're like, wait. I love you. <laughs> like there's no, there's no, there's no getting to know. I love you. Right. Um, and we just we we had you know we, we were kindred spirits in the sense that they don't do what I do, you know. Um, they were really trying to see what I do, mm -hmm. right? So, kind of how do we quantify a lifestyle guy? And you know, but luckily I had you know track record of yeah. proving the ROI on lifestyle. So we kind of got down to brass tacks and, and and formed a partnership. And you know she she took me on. A journey to Lynchburg. Um, obviously, Tennessee whiskey comes from That's Lynchburg. Um, and as I begin to un unravel the story, you know, it was reparations even for me. Mm -hmm. Not only because you know Nathan Uncle Nearest Green was a slave, right? And he taught a Jack young Daniel. Jack Daniels yeah. how to distill on number seven or taught him the charcoal mellowing process. Um, you know, it was like wow, like I'm finally an owner. Yeah, we're celebrating him. You know, our foundation puts all of the descendants through college. That's dope. It's like seven rides. of them, right? It's like nine. Nine, nine okay. Yeah, nine now. That's dope. Um, so. And I'm not just talking about, you know, the initial phase. You know, the first, you can go, you know, your bachelor's, you can go right. your master's, your doctor, however far you want to go in school. Um, so that's where all our marketing money goes. Um, <laughs> but it's worth every penny because the story um, 
was so necessary, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? And it was so necessary too to take care of his descendants in the process. So. so, so you have equity in the company, and you are by nature because of your personality and everything, and what you do, you are the the brand. Yes, I am. I am a brand ambassador. And then you have company. folks, you know, in different locations or whatever doing that. Yes, I, I. So I created the influencer programs that everybody uses. So in the in the in the terms that I would normally be introducing ambassadors, they would be guys in the club and this that, and the third. Mm -hmm. Now we have a sales force of ambassadors versus people that go spin in clubs and pop bottles. So okay, yeah. it's been a very, um, honestly, it's been a very amazing experience because at the end of the day, you know, 80% of whiskey drinkers are white, right? Okay, and, right. And, and we, we have seen in our urban culture when it comes to spirits, they'll move to whatever if it's hot. You got that right. Not, not even that they love the spirit. Right now, mind you, Uncle Nearest is aged nine years. Mm -hmm. If and I'm not, I want your opinion. Anyone else who's had a drink or sip, it's probably the best whiskey out. It's the it's hundred proof. It's smooth as silk. It's incredible, son. Thank I mean, you. I ain't gonna lie. I'm not, right? I'm sitting here just salivating looking at it right. Right, now. and so and so when you think <laughs> about it though, right? So it's not a hard sell once you taste nah, it, right? So nah. we're, and we're talking about if you drink brown. Let's just keep the category around brown. That's mm -hmm. whiskey, that's bourbon, that's, you know, aged tequila, añejo, that's, mm -hmm. you know. Cognac. Whatever. Right? You can, ever, you can get into this mix. You can feel this. You will taste it and you will like it. So my point is, I think now, you know, you're going to see a shift, right? So if 80% of the whiskey drinkers are white, all right, boom. We went that route as far as we're not going to. This is not a sparkler brand. Right. <laughs> you got not, that right. This is not what <laughs> this is not what you're used to seeing from me, right? Right, right. But now you also are seeing like, you know, if you follow me, you know I'm into Cuban cigars. You yeah. know that I have an affinity for the finer things in life. Yeah. And you know, I travel the world and I drive in Gumball three thousand and I do so <laughs> everything high end uh -huh. right matches. So that's how we get this three sixty lifestyle movie. So, and you kind of touched on it a little bit, but what do you think about the relationship in, in the future between hip hop culture, black culture, and whiskey? Because, you know, people yeah. are drinking yak, you know, and, and vodka. Yeah. That's the, the biggest things you're going to see in our community when it comes to, um, you know, culture wise and in, in the clubs and so on and so forth. You know what? It has to do with taste. It's mm -hmm. like Gucci, Prada, J. Crew, you know, Gap. What's your preference? What do you like best? You know what I'm saying? You can't tell me that any liquor. It's like, oh my God, it tastes like, you know, the sweetest, sultriest piece of candy I've ever, it's, that's <laughs> not what liquor does. Right. You drink liquor to get a buzz, to relax, to calm down, For to sure. whatever. So it becomes then, okay, what is my drink of choice? What am I, go what is the libation that's yeah. going to take me where I need to go? Right. Um, and I just, for me, I'm putting Uncle Nears in perspective. If you live life for a living, if you want to reach the ultimate in whatever you do, and you need accompaniment in in that on that journey to that experience, Uncle Nears is your partner. I recommend it, yo. Uh, it's that, that Tennessee, that charcoal situation they got going on with that man, that thing is serious. Yeah, he saved a few things <clears throat> for himself. Um, for sure. That are obviously when you taste this and then you taste Jack, it does not taste like Jack. Um, so it's, it's, it's a beautiful situation, man. And, and I really call it lightning in the bottle. And I'm not just talking about the juice. I'm talking about the experience mm -hmm. to find a brand with this much heritage and this much legacy, yeah. right? It's, it's almost unheard of. For sure. And this is a proven fact. It's a fact. rich story behind it. Yeah, I mean, it, Jack Daniels mentioned him 50 times, over 50 times. His actual... Um, sons and him over 50 times and we bought that biography by the way oh, and dope. this bottle on the this is where Jack Daniels grew up okay. this is the Dan Call farmhouse which we now own oh okay yeah, yeah 330 yeah. acres that's nuts yeah we're also building a distillery on another 220 acres it's an equestrian farm okay if you know anything about Tennessee whiskey and horses are everything <laughs> right for so, sure yeah so we'll have actually you know award winning horses on the property all black, um, black owned business. Black owned oh. business. Man, Keith, Keith, and Fawn Weaver. They're the co-founders. Their husband and wife. Um, you know, they founded it, created it, and brought a player on. <laughs> now it's gonna go to the next level. I'm really interested in seeing where it goes, man. Because that's my beautiful wife. Wave to my oh, wife. Oh, hey, they, she's they, cute. Wifey over there. Yeah. <laughs> that's dope. 
Um, you know, I'm a big time whiskey guy, big time, you know, brown brown guy, and um, I'm I'm curious to see where it goes, man, and how yeah. it translates into our into our culture. It's really moving very fast. I, mm-hmm. I know you know spirits, and if you look at the trajectory of what Clooney and Gerber did with uh, Casamigos, I mean, mm-hmm. we're, we're yeah, on track. To, right. We're on track to do thirty thousand cases first year. Yeah, you haven't seen a commercial on TV. Nothing. They sold for a billion dollars in their fourth year, and they were only at sixty nine thousand. That's cases. nuts. Oh, so you can imagine, like we surpassed thing. them their first year. Yeah, yeah. And we had, and like they didn't have a distillery, and I mean, obviously their brand, the brand was amazing, and they had Clooney and mm-hmm. Gerber had that experience um, as well. But you know, it's lightning in a bottle, baby. Were you a whiskey drinker before you came out? I was not. I was a tequila drinker. Oh, whoo, buddy. Yeah, I That's was a tequila drinker, but I drank añejo tequila. Okay. So when we launched. Deli on Tequila, he had uh, an aged in Yeho called okay. Leona. And I got a couple cases of that and I didn't look back. And then when I couldn't have that, I would get like Don Julio on Yeho because that's a really good one as well. And yeah. then, you know, then they had the 1942, which I actually like Don Julio on Yeho better. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then when I had this, I mean, it was no way I could not drink what I own. It's 100 proof, man, but it don't feel like you're drinking 100 proof. You know what, though? I will tell you this. It does not feel like it, but when you, you you're, you're four drinks in, you're oh, like, it feels like oh, afterwards. shit. <laughs> Wait a minute. Everybody calm down. Am I naked or am I dressed? <laughs> right. Like, it, it really, it could go left quick. And it that's why I always tell yeah. people, you know, I just gifted the guys from the Joy Club. And they were like, I said, yeah, I'm going to tear this up tonight. I was like, no, you're not. I said, no, drink you are responsibly not. now. Yeah. But no, it's, it's definitely, um, it's definitely that get right. Well, look, man, I got Kenny Burns in front of me right now, so I'm going I'm to call this next piece Game Time. Mm-hmm. I need a little something from you. So. Need some game? Let's get it. Listen, so um, you said, um, you mentioned Andre Harrell. Yes. Uh, you mentioned before in a previous interview that I watched that he taught you um, how to take your creative vision and make it tangible. Yes. What was the process like for you when it was just a passion that you were pursuing and how valuable were those teachings? You know what, man? You know, when you're a creative, you're creating. And when you're young creating, it's not really to do anything in specific. You're finding your way. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, I played basketball. I was good at basketball. But I'd rather go by the Gucci's at the Madness shop. You know what I'm <laughs> right. talking about? Or I'd rather, you know, and I mind you, they were double the price because Gucci didn't sell the tennis shoes here in D.C. Unless, unless you were driving, and I wasn't. I was 15. Right. Right? So I paid double. But my point is, I, I started seeing my passions were not, and what I was doing, I liked it. I was good at it. I could have went to you know college playing ball, mm-hmm. but I got locked up my senior year. But it really was trial and error, right? Right. That I would experience, you know, um, the discovery of my true talent. And it always was people. I knew I knew my talent was people. I just didn't know how I was going to shape and mold it. But Andre gave me the battery pack to kind of say, "Look, it's you." Right, because when you're young, people taking, oh, you're dope, you're a great videographer. Come work with me, instead of saying, you know what, I think you're the best videographer. I'm gonna put it in perspective for you. I know such and such, such and help you grow yeah. and go. Right. Yeah. But I didn't have the luxury that Andre was the first person. Like, I want you to do everything you want to do, and here's the playground. That like for me, that was like. So you think, okay, boom, this is what happened. I got into the music business. I wasn't a music guy. I just uh-huh. love music. So I didn't really have a talent of producing, singing, writing, so forth and so on. I just, I just knew I could put the pieces together and I was fly. Right. He said, all right, cool. What you want to do? I was like, I'll go on radio. Now, mind you, I didn't, I wasn't trying to be in radio. <laughs> right. I just picked something. Yeah. But I broke a record, you know, Stilo's. I mean, 702 Stilo I broke in 92Q in Baltimore. Okay. And that was just because I knew something and I could put the pieces together. And then it was like, oh, I want to do a remix. And then I did a remix, you know what I'm saying? That's and dope. he stayed up all night, brought it back the next day, next, two days later, it's on the radio. So it was an opportunity to find myself. But the end game and what I learned the most from him is that he told me that I was what everyone bought into. Not the artist, not the clothes, yeah, not the yeah, stand up third, that yeah. I was the one. So. It was just a, it was a it was a great journey in in the from a discovery standpoint, but it was even better. And to your point earlier, like the importance of a mentor. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. For like sure. it's most important because without him, I'd have still been. You know, you try I'm right because you're creative. Around, right. Yeah, but you, you it's almost like running into walls when you don't have the the information that just to the left 
two rights, you can get around that wall, yeah, and there's level. a whole other world out there. So mm-hmm. he, he he opened my eyes to that portion of my journey. That's dope, man. So we on Whiskey and Kicks right now, Kenny Burns. And um, so I want to know, man, what, what you prefer to put on your feet these days? Let's say when you just walk in the streets or, you know, doing whatever you want to do uh, this weekend. Jordan 1s are my favorite. Yeah? They're my favorite sne- sneaker. My favorite designer sneaker is the St. Laurent um, with the fringes. Okay. My favorite shape shoe that because it's hard to f- like these these tennis shoes these these athletic shoes that these I can't understand the big <laughs> the big the big extra large like what are these fucking Balenciaga like da- the dash shoes bro I'm confused <laughs> it's crazy but um Saint Laurent probably has my favorite and I like I like some Margellas too the, the low top Margellas they have a nice shape yeah um but this trip I bought Jordan ones um. Uh, Nam uh Nam Kill. He did the dip, the paint dipped Air for Air Max 97. Okay. I had him on yesterday. Okay. You can find a picture and post it, but I love them. I wore them. Y'all can't put yeah. I can't put Maxes on no more, man. They kill my feet now. 97s? Oh no, no. I'm thinking about the OG yeah, the yeah, ones. Yeah, yeah. These are 97. Yeah, I never I never wore on uh, 97. 97 is my that's when I met my wife in 97. Oh, that's that was dope. the first tennis shoes I bought her. That's dope. <laughs> yeah, yeah, ever. Yeah, I can dig that. So, are you one of those people who uh, you buy and put them up on the shelf, or you you buy like me? I buy mine to wear them. I I wear them. Yeah, I, I don't even that. keep the boxes. I hear that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Down. I used to keep every box. She'd be looking at me like Kenny. It's 300 boxes. It's, like, what are you? But it's not. Yeah, you gotta wear them because just like my OG DJ Clark Kent says, if you don't wear them, you will uh, be sorry. Clark Kent is a big time sneakerhead yeah. for sure. So so what's next for you, man? Man. Um, just launched a, uh, I'm sorry, just partnered with um, a new marketing company. Okay. Zoom Marketing Partners. Um, we have an amazing piece of business on the tobacco side. We had just got Beam Centauri. Um, we're doing uh, a bunch of great things on, on that. I'm creating a few properties. I, I learned in the marketing space that you can have a business, you can have clients, but you're only as good as you, as long as you have the clients. Indeed. And when you ha- actually have properties, you can sell that to anybody Mm -hmm. all the time and not have to stick to one. Mm -hmm. You know, I I always equate it to Al Heyman and the Budweiser Superfest. Al Heyman didn't stop when the Budweiser Superfest stopped. Right. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? Because he created the property and um so yeah, I'm I'm into to those things. You have a movie coming out too. Yeah, you know, linked up with Will Packer man. Fight night. Um Fight Night is the a story about the biggest heist in Georgia history. It's a period piece from 1971. Um, at the helm of it was a guy named Chicken Man. <laughs> and H.D. Uh, Hudson. I wonder what that guy's about. <laughs> yeah, the first black detective in Atlanta who was assigned to Muhammad Ali on his comeback fight. Okay. And when he was off of the draft dodger thing. But it's a big heist movie. And it's really Uptown Saturday Night, which is a weird thing, too, because now Will Smith and Kevin Hart just announced that they're going to do Uptown Saturday Night. Oh, so, that, so that might cause some... Yeah, it's pretty big. Me, but yeah, <laughs> but but you know, it was it was a blessing to go through that process. It took me uh, eighteen months, I Word. think, to get the life rights done. It took me another six months to. It only took me three weeks to to get the answer back from Universal. On, yeah, on Will and I pitch, but um, it, it, you know, beautiful experience, man. Well, you you didn't get your part now, paid in full, but you don't get a part in this one. Nah, <laughs> I, I don't want to be famous anymore. <laughs> right, I'm taking the back seat. I'm promoting everybody else. Indeed, indeed, man. Yes, Look, sir. Kenny, man, I appreciate this, man. Um, you know, give me a shot to sit down with you and uh, talk about some booze and shoes and everything you got going on. Booze and shoes. Where you the know, t-shirts? Shit. Whiskey and kicks. I know, right? <laughs> See, when you want to smile like that? Yeah. I got to get my numbers up first, man, so no, it makes sense. It. You're going to do you it. You know what I mean? So um, and, and enjoy the rest of your weekend. It was great meeting your wife. And um, it's a nice setup over here, this hotel. So, you know, thanks yes. for everything. Yes, glad to have you, man. The Eaton Workshop Hotel, 12th and K, y'all. One of the most beautiful properties. I've ever seen. So yeah, make sure y'all check it out. Yeah, definitely, man. Appreciate it. All love. Yes, sir. Be good, man.